Hello everybody, in this episode of Welton Guys, we will take a closer look at the Navarian Empire, which you may be familiar with from previous episodes. Many of you have also asked how the empire is organized as a society and how it is governed. So in this video we will talk more about the society itself and what makes up the different classes. And if you're interested in another video about the organization of the government and the military of the Navarian Empire, then be sure to let me know in the comments. It is important to know that the Navurian Empire is a theocracy, strongly influenced by the belief in the goddess Avonal and officially ruled by her messenger, the God Emperor himself. Right next to the God Emperor come the so-called Nevur, who form a sort of royal government out of three chosen ones. This means that there is a Nevur representing religion and culture, a Nevur for the military and defense and another for the economy and administration respectively. But a Nevur is not something you can become, but instead are born as, because a Nevur is considered a child of the God Emperor. It is believed that they reveal themselves through their above average intellect, extraordinary beauty, special magical abilities or otherwise. It is documented that there are only 24 of these Nevur at a time who vanish just as suddenly and mysteriously as they appear. And each Nevur is discovered as a child and adopted by one of the 24 dynasties. These dynasties are at the top of the human hierarchy and form the so-called Conceal of Light which consists of representatives from each of the 24 families. These families whose ancestors form the core of the Nevurian culture and civilization share a unique history. The council is divided into the so-called inner circle and the outer circle. The inner circle is made up of seven families said to be descendants of the rulers of the first Nevurian city-states, who at that time, together with the god emperor, formed the first Nevurian kingdom, a kingdom that laid the foundation for today's Nevurian culture and civilization. The outer circle consists of 17 families which also come from the Nevurian cultural sphere and were all annexed and conquered by the seven families of the inner circle during the first expansion wars of the young kingdom. Without going into details, the council of light was supposedly a method of preventing further wars although that may not be the true motivation behind forming the council in the first place. The Nevur and the Council of Light form the elite of the empire and are worshipped as saints or even gods in some parts of the empire. As the power of individual families exceeds the power and wealth of other separate nations, powerful private armies, huge manufactories and large trading empires are owned by these families and always act in the interests of the Nevurian empire. While you can't reach the aforementioned classes without the right blood in your veins, they are also influential and the powerful people who were able to establish their power from scratch. Among them are important military figures such as generals and officers, high priests, high-ranking government officials as well as wealthy merchants and entrepreneurs. Theoretically, with enough effort, anyone can make it into this upper class and become a leading figure in the Nevurian Empire. But no one ever said it would be easy. As you already know, wealth and prosperity are important components of the Nevurian culture. Almost anyone can reach a certain social class with enough determination and skill. So you could say that this is the Nevurian dream. This upper class lives in magnificent mansions that are usually in the inner provinces of the empire that were created from the former city-states. It is not uncommon for aspiring personalities who commit themselves to one of the 24 dynasties and promise their unconditional loyalty in order to rise even further up in the hierarchy of the empire. Corruption, intrigue and secrets are not uncommon in the upper ranks of the empire, which is why some come and go and may never be seen again for what happens behind the shadows of politics is hidden, as if there is another driving force that controls the empire. Military commanders, wealthy laborers, small merchants and priests belong to the middle class of the empire. They are the normal people in the empire and are characterized by the fact that they try to preserve their status by any means necessary in order to not fall into the lower class. This middle class enjoys the less expensive luxuries offered by the empire 
and the protection of its armies. Normally, members of this class weren't born as Nevorian and obtained Nevorian citizenship through their own achievements, which is why the empire is characterized by its multicultural composition. Among the citizens in the middle class, a few came to the empire as slaves or even prisoners and fought for their escension. The lower class consists of all sorts of people who may still call themselves Navarian citizens. They are free by law, but they are not too different from the slaves below them. They share jobs with the slaves and some are actually in a worse situation than those who have a master. Despite their freedom, the citizens of the lower class are poor and have to provide for themselves. So it's not uncommon that some citizens sell themselves or even their children into slavery for a chance of a better life. And many also go the path of the soldier and dedicate themselves to the sword for a lifetime. A prominent example of the Nevurian underclass are the slums and shanty towns outside the walls of the capital city of Nevuria. The people who live there have formed a subculture with their own dialect, special eating rituals and clothing style. It is not very surprising that this place is also home to almost every crime in the city of Nevuria. Very few make it out of the hell that is this class and even fewer make it out without outside help. Although the slaves who are still below the lower class have fewer rights and cannot be called free, they are, as already mentioned, often in a better situation. This is because only citizens of the upper class or above own slaves and also consider them as a status symbol. As harsh as it may sound, the slaves are exploited for hard labor, but it is also ensured that they are physically well cared for and their appearance well kept to be a representative of their masters. This may not sound too bad at first glance and while the slaves officially receive a pay, their owner decides how high it is and how much they are willing to pay for the living expenses of the slaves. A ruthless master is therefore responsible for making his slaves fall into a bottomless pit of debt and therefore pass on their slave status to their children or even other family members. Less ruthless masters allow some slaves to climb out of their slave status by promoting special achievements or talents. While we didn't go into more detail about the cultural differences between these groups, I hope this was a good intro video to the organization of the Neverian Society. I plan to produce a video for each class which shows the everyday life of a citizen of each respective group. If you also like this idea and or would like to see something else that interests you, leave a comment below and yeah, this was the video. Until then, it's been welcome guys, goodbye.